March the 20th, and that means what? Well, it means that Jim Scarcelli, the former Wolverine, is with us. It also means, Scar, that we are one month away from the spring game. And this past Monday, Michigan started actually practicing, and it's great to see you. Scar, what's going on? Yeah, they started practice. Denny, I went through uh, spring ball, man, five times, four times, I guess. You know, they, we, it was 20 practices back then. We hit every darn practice. They'd give you a little T-shirt. Bo would give you a little T-shirt at the end. 20 practices. I survived if you made all 20 practices. Not, not everybody made the 20 practices. It was tough. And, um, yeah, so they're going through it. And I, I, I talked to somebody. They haven't even hit. They just go They go non-padded. The first two practices are non-padded. Mm. That was unheard of in my era. We were smacking and cracking the second we came out there, the first practice. So it's a, it's a different world. You save these guys. You, you know, it's just, it's just smarter, man. You know, you can, you can learn a lot of football without beating your body up. Obviously, you got to do some hitting. You got to get some of it in to find out, you know, what do you got? But you got to be uh, you got to be smart with how much you do. It's going to be fifteen practices uh, now that culminates in one of those being at Michigan Stadium on April the twentieth. Well, part of spring ball is including their new defensive coordinator and other new defensive coaches, Wink Martindale. Scar's got some thoughts on Coach Martindale, the defensive coordinator. With the NCAA tournament starting tomorrow, Michigan couldn't feel the team if they were involved. Everybody's gone, including the head coach. We'll talk about that attrition with Scar, but we've already started talking about spring practice. So let's just stay right there, Scar, and talk about uh, practice. Kirk Campbell on Friday, I asked him how much hitting he's going to do with his quarterbacks. And I said, considering that, Jaden Denigal, he said himself, he compared him to like a Ben Roethlisberger buying time in the pocket, a bigger guy that he can move around to be able to find his throwing lanes. And then we all know about Orgy's ability to scramble and and, and how he, that's a big part of his game. And, and Tuttle's got some wheels too. And I asked about uh, hitting the quarterback. And he said he likes going live when he's got a quarterback competition like this. Not so much J.J. last year. They They knew – who was going to be the starter and what he could do. So they didn't need to put him live, but they got three, four, five guys. And if it really is a tight competition and some of these guys getting a read on what they can do, moving the team, scoring points. It, it, I don't know if it has, it's not as much with their legs, but it, it, that's part of their game. Yeah. Denny, where we are at with the quarterback position, you have to do that. You have to go live you know, they have to try to determine, you know, the differences between these guys. You know, you can evaluate their throwing, but the ability to escape, the ability to make plays with your legs can be the, the separator. So you have to do it. I totally understand it. This is the time to do it. Um, and, you know, you got to coach the defense up. Look, we're going to put a pink jersey on them. But, but they're live, or maybe they won't put a pink jersey on them. But they're live, but just be smart. If you got a blindside shot at the guy, you know, you don't want to take that like he's, you know, from Michigan State. But you, you know, be smart about it, but you have to have them live. You got to find out who can escape, who can, you know, what who what plays this guy can do that this guy can't. So I totally understand it. But yeah, Denny, I just I just got some things here that, you know, going into spring, I'm looking at this football team. Every single guy down at Shem Beckler Hall, I don't know that I covered this last week, everybody has something to prove. Every single person down there has something to prove. You know, these, these guys are, we won uh, the last three years, but you look at your own more, got something to prove. You look at the new offensive line coach, got something to prove. New tight end coach, new running back coach. You know, everybody, and now the whole defense is all new. You don't think there's pressure on these guys, which is good. They all got something to prove. And all these players, you know, got something to prove. The guys that are coming back as starters, Will Johnson, what's he got to prove? What's Mason Graham got to prove? Can you lead? What kind of leader are you? We know you can play. 
we know those guys can play. You know, Josiah Stewart, you know, and, uh, and, and Donovan. We know you can play, but now can you lead? Can you bring all these other guys up? Can you make them better? Can you build this team that's that's going to fight like hell? You know, like like Joel Klatt said, you know, we, we were more committed. Well, <laughs> why were we more committed? That stuff, it, it happens in the spring. It's about leadership. It's about coaching leadership, playing leadership. You know, so everybody's got something to prove. And um, just want to throw that out. It's a good reminder. This is the, the start of the 2024 season. What have these guys been doing since January the 8th? We know when we last left them, a couple days after, they were having a parade. <laughs> then they had a celebration that night. But have those guys been sitting around eating pizza and cheeseburgers? Or have they been working their tail off in the winter phase so they could get ready for spring ball? And I just think about, I guess it would be three years ago now, Michigan had two guys on the inside, Chris Jenkins, and Mozzie Smith. And yet Mason Graham is a, a true freshman came in for spring ball. And by the time the season started, he was a starter. That's pretty much unheard of, but you know, you, even though you have your spot, we're penciling everybody in, I've done the same thing with freshmen transfers. And then you know guys that have just uh, accepted a challenge to really push the guy in front of them. This is where you, you you're making a name for yourself here in, in Springs. And if you're not rising up the depth chart, you're showing everybody that you're here and you're ready to go and you're pushing the guy that's in front of you. And then it's, it's crucial, man. These, these 15 practices are crucial. And especially when they get into the, I mean, now you got to show that you're, you can't make mental mistakes when you're not in the pads. Okay. You just, you better be in the right spot. You better do all the mental stuff. But when you get the pads on, you know, you you got to show. It's so important. There's so many guys that are that are now second, third year guys that are ready to compete because those coaches are making decisions every single day. They're evaluating every single rep. Every single rep is being evaluated. And uh, I just want to throw this out, Denny. That I know you talked about it, but I got to talk about the Scruggs thing. Coach Scruggs really lit your own more down really lit the defensive lineman down. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just can't, I would be furious if I was Sharon Moore, you bring this guy in and you, 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 uh, now we, we got a couple of analysts over there coaching these guys. Are you kidding me? You know, right before spring ball sp supposed to start, you got analysts. Now those kids are looking for their coach. So I'm, I'm seriously disappointed with it as a, as a, just as a Michigan guy, former player, those players deserve more. And uh, I, I, you know, listen, he's gonna, he's, he's embarrassed his family. He embarrassed Michigan and it, it's, it's gonna, you know, we'll get over it. He's gonna, he's gonna sit the bench for a while, be suspended. It is what it is. And no one should be fired over it, but man, you just, you, you just can't have it. You let guys down and uh, you, we got some good analysts. One of Wink's guys and that other, I forget the names of those guys are working with those kids. Because it's, you know, it's so important, man. You've got spring ball. You're starting, you know, these kids got to get acclimated to the new coach. You know, how is he teaching things? What does he expect? What does he want? And, and look, you beat it up. I just wanted to throw it out there. It's it's so – you can't – you're going to ask your players to do all the right stuff, man. you got to live it too. Well, the only thing that I would add, you said that you don't think that this is a fireable offense and that it really depends how Michigan is looking at his past. Now in the courts, I believe after 10 years, a, a DUI comes off your record. Does that mean when Sharon Moore was interviewing Scruggs and certainly that they had two incidences where he was uh, arrested on suspicion of, of DUI, did that come up? Did they put some language in where uh, they said this is a, a one-time deal. We don't know those particular things, but if Michigan is looking at it like letter of the law, just like every other coach, hey, that was in his past. We didn't even need to address it. Then maybe they do look at this as a one-time a situation and that he gets a second chance. Not everybody would look at it like that. I think that you could look at it like this is a second and a third time yeah. uh, strike against him, and they could easily 
move on because of cause in the contract and and, and look for a new defensive coordinator. I don't know how Michigan is looking yeah. at it uh, and how Sharon Moore will approach it. A lot of Michigan fans are looking at it like this was a uh, first-time offense. And, yeah, you know, uh, hopefully it gets his life straight and let's just move on. He's a good coach. Others will look at it like this is a uh, – this is a three strike situation. So it just really all depends. Yeah, if, then if they were to fire, you look at it. put yourself in that. If I'm Sharon Moore, though, if I'm going to fire him, I'm going to fire him right when it happened. I'm going to get a new coach right away. So we get spring ball rolling. I'm not screwing around with him. Yeah. Well, he's you gonna, don't know. I mean, yeah. I, I would, I would disagree with that a little bit. Like you, you've got all of the information that you've been able to determine from, uh, Coach Scruggs, I don't know if they have uh, the police report where they have everything in there. If they actually have okay. uh, what his uh, you know blood alcohol was there, I do think though. You, I think there's that it's been this long. I think that you know 24, 48 hours, he would have a good idea about uh, what that was. I think myself that I would look at it as a repeat that he would be a repeat offender. And I know that you might seem harsh to a lot of people. It doesn't mean that I'm just throwing him out in the street and I don't care about him. I would look to help him as much as uh, I could uh, if he needed treatment and, and anything else to go along with that. But uh, in the part about you get out on and you say, hey, everybody deserves a second chance. Know this, that when he's out recruiting, that the negative side will be the uh, negative recruiting against him. Anybody has a situation where the other opponent is calling you up saying, Hey, you really want to play for this guy? He's got a third. They're going to say, this is a third time. They're not saying, Oh, well, the 10 years fell out and they're, you know, they're looking at this as uh, he will be branded as a, uh, a, a three time arrested for alcohol offense coach, and that's going to be used against him. Now you can say, you don't care. You're standing by him. And that's, I don't know. People want to stand by him. It depends how you view it. And then how Sharon Moore has viewed it. And we'll find out how he yeah. is going to view it. Yeah, a couple things. Uh, yeah. Denny, it's, it's over and it's, uh, we got to move forward and hope those uh, analysts, that's what, one thing good about the, the analysts. Now these guys are not GAs. Like in my day, that would have been a GA or some other clown filling in. These guys are proven coaches, you know, Wink's guy and the other guy, those are guys that have been coaching. So, Hey, Scar, yeah. I would tell you that, look, look at last year. Michigan didn't have their their uh, head coach for the last three games. And then the first three games, you had different coaches. You had, it depended yeah, well, if you were in the first half. Danny, I, listen, we half. beat that up. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bigger advocate on preparation and practice than that than game. I talked about it. I'd rather be there for practice all week in a minute, no question. But I want these guys there now. we got to get coached up. These kids got to find their guy. Okay, that's I got that. your point. I got your point. I've been thinking about this Alfred thing, this – this uh, coach we got, this running back coach. I think Tony Alford. All right, I'm. I'm just thinking about it. I think it's a good sign, not just for Michigan, but it's a good sign. And, and maybe we talked about that. Maybe there's something going on over there in Columbus that Coach Alford's sizing up. That maybe this this ship is sinking. Maybe we got some rats over here fighting amongst each other. There was reports about that. Maybe there's some dysfunction. And he wants out. So that's what I'm hoping. I don't know for sure. But I I just, you know, I'm just reading, trying to, uh, you know, Columbo it, Denny. So I'm hoping that's what's happening. And that's that on that. I, I know you beat it up. But uh, I got one other thing, Denny, that if I'm preparing, and I tell you something that I would look at if I'm a college football coach now. Every, look, college co coaches in, in all professions, we copy what other people are doing that's successful. You know, and I a guy that I would be looking at if I'm coaching college football a program is I'd be looking at what Kansas does on offense. They do some unique stuff. And um, if I again I would I would take a look at all the shifting. Penn State hired their either offensive, either quarterback coach or somebody to be their offensive uh, coordinator, James Franklin. He sees it. I watch Kansas play. They're doing unique stuff. They're doing headache, problematic stuff. They beat people. They don't just beat people with talent. Guys are real good, innovative, offensive coach. So I don't know. 
what Michigan's doing there. And we do a lot of shifting and stuff that gives people headaches. But I would take a look at it. I guarantee you people in college football, Danny, are, are looking at some of the things Kansas is doing, and we're going to see more of it around college football this year. It makes sense. And if, um, especially if Orgy is your quarterback, considering who was uh, at the controls there for the Jayhawks, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I don't know if it, no, it doesn't make, it doesn't matter who our quarterback is. Some of the shifting and the problematic stuff they do, getting your defense lined up, it, it's just good stuff, man. It just, it's just headaches. Okay, but they did have a dual threat guy there as well. Yeah, you can. I mean, that can. That's always a, a problematic stuff when you have a dual threat quarterback. Regardless of what you do, you can just be in one formation, and a guy that can run is always tougher to defend. There's no question. So, but the stuff they do, you know, is the things Michigan and Jim Harbaugh has done, and Sharon Moore's been around. He sees what we did when we, we, we. He had Manny Diaz confused two years ago in, in Michigan State, and he was lost. All of our shifting and stuff that we were giving him, man, was just in, and that's the stuff Kansas does. And I'm just uh, just pointing it out, something I would be doing. I like it. I, I, I Looking at cutting edge and what's working across college football, it's like even though Michigan, their their defensive scheme is sound. Everybody's watching the Michigan tape. You know what can they do to to be like Michigan? On well, they're hiring guys too, Danny. That's a problem. You get you, the problem with with the Ravens' success defensively. I mean, how many of these guys are now? There, it's getting infiltrated. It's all over the place. You got the Seattle coach. You got now San Diego Charger coach. You got the Baltimore coach, and you got all them guys that got coordinator jobs that were on that Raven staff last year. And now you you know you you got the UCLA guy worked under Wink, so you're getting more and more of it, and uh, you know that's not good when you know that's what always hurt the academies. You know when more and more people were running the the, uh, the, the you know their offense, it hurts them. But uh, well, we'll get into Wink in uh, in a minute, and that's you know make that transition and talk about what's he going to do that's unique. You know. Unique for Wink. Okay, what else when it comes down to spring football? I put down on Monday, Scar, some of the things I thought they, whether you want to call them storylines or things to do, I put up, uh, no, that's that's not it. Let's see here. Um, well, give me a second to look through them all. I'll just page through while we're sitting here. It was... Um, what I was looking for for the players. I guess I'll have to page through it a little bit more, but obviously the, the quarterback and uh, the kicker were, and then we found out that Hinton is going to be at left tackle. So, you know, who's going to be over at right tackle. And as you mentioned, uh, the, the depth uh, is important as well. Yeah. You just, you know, you want to get, um, get a pretty good idea who your top 44 players are, you know, who your kicker, your long snapper. And you, you know, that's what you want to come out of there with. So you, you know, who's my two, three deep and uh, who's looking to transfer on out. And who, you know, what, what do we, what do we got? You're sizing it up every day as a coach, man. You know, I, I had 50, 50, 60 guys at times, you know, they got 140 they're looking at and, and every single rep, every single drill is, uh, is, is a factor when the competition is tight. So they're, 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 they're trying to size it up. There you go. Okay. Well, uh, anything else on what these guys are trying to get done uh, a month before we will see them uh, on display in the, in the spring game? No, you know, just getting, uh, you know, getting used to the, 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 the new coaches and we're going to, you know, we're going to see the difference with Wink. And, you know, I, I, I listen to, uh, I listen to him talk. And I, I, I've got down there, Wink the Magician, you know, and I'm thinking if I was in his position, you know, and I've got this job and they're asking you, you know, well, what about you and, and McDonald? Or what about you and Minter? Or what are your philosophies? And, you know, Wink says, well, I, I'm a little more aggressive than Jesse. That's what he said. He said, I'm a little more aggressive than Jesse. Okay, well, if I had the job that Wink is in, I'm not, I'm going to keep throwing curveballs. That's all I'm doing is throwing curveballs to the enemy. If they're going to be listening to me, well, what the hell does that mean? I'm more aggressive, you know? So we're going to find out. I was, I was looking at 
some Giants film of this past year. And let me just say this. Wink had much better players in Baltimore. <laughs> when I watched the Baltimore defense when he was coaching there, you know, maybe he didn't have enough to have, have the Giants defense long enough, but they just – they weren't as good. The Ravens drafted defense. They played better defense. They looked like they had better players. But, you know, he, he was doing some things a little different than Minter and McDonald. Uh, I'm, I'm – uh, but I'm I'm hoping that we get you know we 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 see this very similar uh, stuff that we've done and, and had been successful with. So look, he has a great relationship with both those guys. He, I didn't realize how much he talks to them. You know, he talks to both of those guys. So that's a great thing. You know, you get because I do that as a coach, man. You know, you you do that. You talk to you you have your uh, your allies. You know, I, my brother and I coach together. We we're in the same league, so we were talking all every week about you know. What are you thinking about? What are you doing about? What'd you do against this guy? How'd you defend this? Or what, you know, so he's going to, he's had long conversations with Minter and long conversations with McDonald, you know, about Ryan Day. I guarantee you, because Ryan Day's still there. Now you got new coaches at Michigan State, so that's irrelevant. But you, you know, but the the, the guys that have been around, James Franklin, you know, you, you try to, you know, what did you do? How did you do it? And, and, you know, he's going to talk about all the all the different schemes and, and everything. But anyway, I, I just think that, um, you know, getting I think his system and, and watching it, it was it was different. And it was it was it was a lot of blitz in. But I didn't see I saw some I saw four guys with their hand in the ground and I didn't see that much from us at all. Mm-hmm. You know, we always had our two edge guys standing up. I didn't, you know, and he had some of that. So we'll, 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 we're going to find out. Here's the question to Wink when he was asked about if, if he was going to be blitz happy. And he did mention Ohio State and Texas's coach. Here's that audio scar. I'm not going to tell Ryan Day or Sark, you know, you know what we're going to do. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I have confidence in these players. They can execute at a high level. Um, I am more aggressive. Than, than Jesse and, and uh, you know, the proofs in the pudding, Jesse and Mike. So we'll see how it works. And, you know, if we can if we can get to the quarterback rushing three, we'll rush three. There you go. He says yeah. he's more aggressive than, than Jesse and Mike. Yeah, well, if he, if he, I guess if that means if you have faith in your, uh, your coverage, maybe you're going to be, you're going to bring more, uh, more pressure and, and put guys out on islands more. That depends on how good, how, how strong is your coverage? How strong is your safe, your ability to cover guys? If, what, I mean, what does that mean? More zone, pre- you know, it can mean a lot of things. It's, a, it's a hard to analyze and, and determine what that means. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on going to practice here, Denny, within a week and I'll, I'll get a feel for things and share what I can, you know, but uh, really, really looking to, see some of these offensive linemen step up and some of these young guys we recruited and, and, and look at some of these backups that have been there. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that Crippen looks like a dominant center, man. And that Gio looks like a guy that's been there four years, sitting on the bench and he's pissed and he's ready. He's ready to start. Same with Crippen. That's what I want to see, man. Guys that are leading them out and uh, they've been sitting on the bench and, and they're ready to go. Love to hear it. Looking forward to that. This programming note, I will have a a sports update like I do 15 minutes prior to the show on Friday, but I am going on vacation for the next four days after today. So we'll be back Monday with the Good Afternoon Michigan football show off for four days after today. Looking forward to, to that. All right, Scar, how about answering some questions before we go to basketball? Okay. Richard was talking about Roethlisberger, said he was very good at moving the pocket. He was younger. Michigan fans will remember that Big Ben Roethlisberger in Miami came into the big house, I believe, when Roethlisberger was a true freshman. And remember thinking, yeah, he's got a pretty good arm on him. Yeah, well, that's what, uh, you know, uh, Coach Campbell, t- I, th- I, think, I think he talked about uh, Denigal you know, in that mold, I, I've stood yeah. next to Denigal as a big, strong strapping. The first time I saw him, I thought he was a tight end. Um, so 
Yeah, you know, you want that big guy that can bounce off people and, uh, you know, that's what we want. Guy quarterbacks that can move, man. Avoid the rush. How many times did J.J. get us out of trouble the last couple of years? <laughs> he did a, did a lot. A lot. Uh, Ferris, I don't know about the validity of what he is saying, but he <laughs> is asking if uh, anyone saw drones flying off of the Stadium Boulevard Bridge today. <laughs> well, practice is this afternoon, so uh, <laughs> that's what we got to deal with now, man. We got the big Mark D'Antonio, Urban Meyer uh, fence, memorial fence over there. Um, Denny, there were some other questions there. Yeah, I'm going to put some of those up. I was just looking at uh, as we go through here. Sorry, let me get back up. Uh, here's one from another one from Ferris talking about Michigan running 61% of the time. Bama ran 62. OSU 51% of the time. Ryan Day is not going to run uh, at 60% with uh, he calls a soft Pac-12 coach. Hey, listen, hey, Ferris, let me tell you something. I talked about this. I've watched I've watched Chip Kelly the last few, you know, the, the evolution of him as a coach. You know, he's not the same guy when he was at Oregon, running, you know, four receivers and one back. When he got in the NFL, he started playing with more tight ends. And when he was at UCLA, he was playing with a lot of tight ends. I, I firmly believe Ryan Day brought – I mean, obviously, Ryan Day has a relationship – that was his coach 20 years ago, right? Wasn't it? They, they go way back. But I think he brought brought him in a large part because, you know, Chip Kelly plays with tight ends. And I think a lot of what they want to do is get their defense by seeing tight ends, by seeing a physical run game so they can beat Michigan. I think a lot of the reason that guy was brought in to help their defense beat Michigan, you know, play with tight ends and run the stuff we run and try to do a better job of it. Get your defense ready. I agree. And Michigan fans have been browbeating Ohio State for three years, calling them soft, and there's a, a there's some truth to it. There so, is. Hey, listen. There, that's what. Yeah, there is truth to the the first couple of years. I think he tried to be more tight ends last year. Yeah. But the first two years when we beat them, yeah, they were spread, 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 and you know, just a, we were just a more physical team. We had a run game. Uh, right. They weren't yeah. ready for that. And I think Ryan Day is, is seeing it and he's trying to toughen them up. And when you throw all day, you don't get your team tough. You don't get your defense tough. It's, it's that, in fact, spring football right now, Denny, I mean, this is where I think about my experience as a player. You know, you go against our offense every day when I was playing. I mean, you're going to learn to uh, defend the run. <laughs> you're going to get no choice because that's yeah. what you're seeing. There's a few different reasons why Michigan over the last three years became uh, a powerhouse. The number one on that list is the, the physicality overall of the offense, defense, and special teams. And they were uh, in front of the curve on that. And other teams have uh, adjusted. And they, But you don't just say, okay, we're going to have to be tougher. But, you know, if you're – you got to, starting with the first day of spring practice, get down there and – it's uh, with your whips and chains, and I know they're not in pads right now, but you have to preach it, you have to believe it, and you have to go through it. Here's hockey question. Mark says that Michigan needs to turn Yost into olympic size ice. He goes back to this weekend. He saw with the first line change, they beat Minnesota at uh, Mariucci. That's their ice. He said, imagine – that speed and skill on the big ice, the Yost's new nickname would be Big Ice, the Big Ice. What do you think? Yeah, I, I used to go to games. A lot of my buddies play, and they're you know they're big time uh, supporters, guys that I pl I went to school with that are hockey guys. And uh, you know, I, 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 I that's an interesting question. I, I never realized it that we weren't uh, that we didn't have the, you know as as big of an ice rink as you know Olympic size. I didn't realize that. Yeah, well, they don't play in the NHL on Olympic size, and it is a big deal when you watch. When I watch the Olympics, and I am watching that extra space behind and uh, on the side, you know, you can use you know, it. It goes almost without saying that if you have speed and you're a good transition team, that that is going to be something that um, you know could could benefit you. Uh, I like the. 
NHL size rinks. And so I, I like the Olympics, save that for the Olympics. Uh, I would not change that myself. Having said that, Mark, Michigan, I haven't seen Michigan play a hockey game like they did against Minnesota uh, in a while. They played almost the perfect game. They used their speed. You saw it in transition. Uh, their defense was excellent. Their their system, the everything that they had going against Minnesota was uh, is was about as good as you, they can beat anybody if they play that way. So they're 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 playing great hockey and and they can beat Michigan State Saturday and they can win it all if they play like they did uh, this past Saturday. Okay, hey, Danny, let me uh, mention something I read about a couple comments from Kirby Smart. I right. talked about the new system now, the NIL, the transfers, and this and that. And he said, and he he referred that, you know, keeping your locker room happy is is a, a whole different uh, deal now for a head coach because you have freshmen who you had to recruit and maybe offer NIL money that's more than guys that have been there. So Kirby Smart talked about it said it's something a coach has to deal with and to try to have that camaraderie and in, in a, uh, a team cohesiveness is a challenge. So that's that. He talked about a, the, dif- the difference in the parking lot, meaning the type of cars that are in the parking lot now opposed to four or five years ago. You know, I remember in my day, I remember Jim Harbaugh had an old beat up Volkswagen bug. I had this beat up, Nova was banged around and, you know, these guys are, but he mentioned it, parking lot, big cars, cohesiveness in the locker room is a big challenge for coaches. Uh, And I'm just going to, I'll finish up on Saban. Saban talked about revenue sharing and and all these other ideas and, um, you know, but with the NIL, he talked about that, but he didn't really get specific about NIL. you know, how he would share the revenue, but he thinks it's, it's, that's where you have to get to have some type of balance in recruiting. Otherwise it's just going to be the have and have not. So I, it was interesting that he was kind of subtly agreeing with some of the things Jim talked about to uh, get, but he wanted it all the, you know, the same amount that, that a Mississippi state, Alabama, Auburn, Michigan, Ohio state, you know, you're going to all offer kids the same amount from a revenue sharing standpoint. Well, it's the number one thing that Michigan fans sit around wondering about last year, Michigan was able to use NIL to keep all of those players and compensate them on the roster. And it was one of the big, re- it's a big reason why they won the national championship. A lot of those guys would have been gone, could have gone uh, elsewhere. It's also been, uh, they've been very successful in being able to retain the players that they have in this transition, now out of, out of Dan Hurley uh, from UConn, the the one seed, the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament, he was complaining about people tra- uh, tampering with his players even before they're playing this tournament right now. Coaches were getting after these Michigan players and offering them, and and U of M was able to use their NIL right now to keep these players and keep this defense almost intact, with the exception of of Keon Sab. So. And look at where it's at right now. Michigan's hill that they have, I don't know, died on, but it, it's their big hill is that they were not going to give money to high school prospects. And then two weeks ago, the NCAA said, we're not looking into any uh, any promised money to players. Even though it's a, you know, so they basically said, Everything that's going on, you can do whatever you want. That, that's what I heard. Now, I don't know how Michigan, like Michigan has said, Ward Manuel was quoted saying that they will be uh, as invested above board as any team with NIL. But now the NCAA is saying we're not looking uh, below board. So what their approach is going to be is pretty fascinating moving forward. Yeah, Danny, I don't believe that those 12 transfers came to our football program last year just because of money. Oh, I, I don't think, think I don't think yeah. so either. I think transfers no, are looking to play. And I think the same thing with and, the same, and they're looking for money. They, well, I get it. It's a part. It's a part of, of many reasons why a kid comes and picks a school. You know, you you pick you evaluate a lot of things when you're getting recruited. That's right. And, and I think that's one of the number one things Sharon Moore has to try to continue. What Jim was able to do is like, hey, I wanted to play for Jim Harbaugh and Jesse Minner 
And Sharon, you know, the guys that came last year, you know, they wanted to be a part of Michigan because Jim had a reputation of developing guys, getting them ready for the pros. A little bit, a little bit of NIL help. You know, you listen to AJ Barner, you listen to these guys, Wallace. They wanted to play for Michigan and Harbaugh and in our system and our coaches and. And that's what Sharon Moore has been able to prove so far, which was I, that's why I'm so happy with it. It's uh, it's it's What's proven. He been able to prove? He's he's proven that we haven't lost guys. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, right. Yeah, not so much bringing them in. I, yeah. I I I firmly believe they have confidence in what we have as to why he hasn't brought a bunch of guys in. I don't think it's. I think maybe we missed on a few guys. I think there there were some guys we were trying to get, but uh, anyway. I'm satisfied with it. We are. It is what it is. And he's. But he has to continue to be able to uh, show that ability to identify great transfers and then bring them in if if they if we feel we need them. Sounds like a song that my daughter plays once around. It is what it is. It was what it was. So we'll see <laughs> what they end up coming up with uh, in terms of the transfer portal. All right. You know, I'm over here just laughing and in. Uh, throwing out lyrics to songs. I'll put a couple more up here before we talk about basketball. Old AOKO says, hopefully they use Samaj Morgan more in deep in the deep passing game. It was an easy tell of a screen pass every time Morgan lined up. Go ahead. Yeah, you you want to have, uh, you, you know, the Scarter report when you play Michigan is that every receiver will go deep or they'll throw bubbles or they'll run, jet, you know, you don't want to get a scouting report on a guy like, you know, he's not a deep threat or, or he, you know, he can't, they won't throw the bubble to him or they don't run jet sweep with him or they won't run him, you know, certain routes they don't run. You don't want that. Those are big tips and tells for the defense. They're still like a tight end. They can't, they, they don't, they don't run behind 18. Can't block. No, you want to be able to have all of your players so that they can do all of the things. So the defense has to defend all of the routes it makes it much much more of a problem. But you're right, uh, AO. We want to have Samaj be a kind of guy that, yeah, every route he can run, every route is a threat. That's what you want. Same thing with our quarterbacks. They can throw all the routes. They can do all the stuff and run it and throw it. And Here's a question about pro Harbaugh. Now, we know that the Chargers dealt Keenan Allen. Ferris is saying that Harbaugh is going to get Bowers. And then he's going to get Corum, and Herbert's going to be the JJ coach in the pro version of Smash. And I know I asked you what you thought the Chargers would do with that number five pick. Uh, they were able to keep Khalil Mack and, and Bosa. They redid their deals, but they don't have Keenan Allen. What it's if you have Harbaugh, guess, Denny? It's typical Harbaugh. He's focusing on defense. What you see there is a guy, he's got his quarterback. He's letting the big-time receiver go. He's going to let those off, but he ain't going to mess with that defense. He's going to give Jesse and, and give give him the best guys he can to play defense. Let that's, me give you this scenario, Scott. That's the hardball mentality. That's the Michigan mentality. All right, you, you're great with the Michigan mentality. You're sitting there. Here's the hypothetical. It's draft night in Detroit, and the first four players – off the board are Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and the and the Vikings move up to the number four spot, and they pick J.J. McCarthy. There's some of the, the draft gurus, Jer, uh, Daniel Jeremiah, I believe. That is his latest uh, mock draft. He's predicted chaos. So that is the Chargers. They can have anybody they want in the draft uh, at number five. A lot of people think that that would be Marvin Harrison, Jr., Maserati Marv with, with Jim Harbaugh, a replacement for Keenan Allen. But all right, Scar, you, you know the Michigan mentality. Is is Harbaugh picking Maserati Marv at number five in that scenario? I mean, he could. I don't that's a good it's a, it's a good situation. He got rid of the other guy. Maybe he thinks we'll get this guy, but he, he, I'd have to study what he did at San Francisco, what his beliefs were, and how much say he had. You know, that was part of the problem there with Bulky and him. He's gonna have some say. I know, but that you're right. I mean, this because but if you look at Jim and John, those guys are going to draft defense early. They're always going to draft defense. I yeah, think I think he's the, moving out. I think he would move out. I don't think he would take Maserati Mob. There's a lot of uh, wide receivers there. If somebody wants to come up at net five. You would think you would be for uh, for Harrison. You would get a premium. Uh, there is a tackle there from Notre Dame 
that I think if he's stuck there, I could easily see him taken. But there's, you know, three or four tackles. And I could, uh, I don't think, I, I don't like Harbaugh taking Marvin Harrison at five. It just doesn't fit for me. It doesn't fit all that. I, I think he would move out, which is, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Easy way out for me. But, you know, I, I stuck it to you and then I took the easy way out. I, I think he would take all from Notre Dame. Yeah, Denny, I just think in general, philosophically, when in doubt, the Harbaugh's are going to take uh, the, use the early picks on defense. I'm not going to uh, argue with you, but I will have you rank the quarterbacks because Mark is talking about some YouTuber who ranked, uh, what's a Big Ten? I don't know what that is. He ranked. Orgy is the 17th best quarterback, and he said that feels crazy uh, to him. So I don't know. Some yeah, right. some YouTuber. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, Orgy. We don't know I if know, Orgy's going to win the I job. want the best. The, the, let's, you know, the best guy to run our offense, man. You know, rank. Let, let's, let's just score points. Who's, the, who's difficult to defend? You know, I, I don't know how, you know, some dude on YouTube, uh, you know, whatever his program is, you know, our coach has got to figure out who's the best guy, who can throw accurate passes, you know, who can uh, avoid the rush. And and that's, that's what, you know, that's what we're going to do, man. You got to let these guys go live a little bit and, and figure out who can avoid the rush. Now yeah. you're right, Ferris. Wink, Wink is very similar to, you know, he's, listen, he's, He's going to show blitz. He's going to show safety and bring an edge. Show an edge, bring a corner. Show linebackers and drop a nose. A, a drop a three technique. So that's what he does. That's what McDonald did. And that's what, um, you know, Minter did. And uh, it's going to be – there'll be – but listen, there were subtle tweaks between Minter and McDonald. I, I saw subtle differences. The foundation was the same, though. Great interior – Defensive linemen that don't get knocked off the ball. Our defense starts, Denny, with those those two inside D linemen not getting knocked off the ball. And, and that's just something we saw the last three years. All right. Ferris is uh, thanking you for answering his question. So there you go. With uh, I'm, I'm looking for some other ones that are um, in here. Uh, Jim talking about uh, the Yoast Ice Arena being a historic building. No question about that. Did you ever uh, have any training over there at the Yoast Ice Arena, Scar? No, I remember working the Michigan camp way back when I first started working that camp back in like 87, 88, and Jimmy Herman was running it. and. We used to have our coaches meeting over there at Yost Arena. We had donuts and coffee. That was it. That was your option for breakfast. And uh, the coaches would meet there at Yost. And Bo always talked about Yost, man. He, he, you know, that was the guy that put Michigan on the map. You know, he always talked about Yost. Without Yost, if, if Yost would have gone to Indiana, there'd be no Michigan. If Yost would have gone to Purdue or some other place, Yost built that stadium. Look at the guy's record. I talked about Yost. Bo talked about Yost. And but then you want to move on to some basketball. I want to say that the Yost Ice Arena is the best college hockey arena in the country. I haven't been to all of them. I've been to a few, but man, uh, it, it just doesn't get any better than Yost. Great atmosphere. The the crowd has everything going from the very top the whole way. There's not a bad spot in the building such great atmosphere i just love that rink so yeah go ahead yeah, Start. Yeah, I'll you. close on it, it, it is a great arena i've been going there since i was a freshman when when john giadano was the coach and then i saw when they transitioned a lot of my buddies were hockey guys and then when red when red got it going boy because i mean you could you could find a seat anywhere when when giadano was coaching they were losing but when red got it going in a couple of years man the place was packed it was a whole different environment uh, yeah, Red, Red Berenson changed that whole thing, man. Old Red Berenson, I got to give him credit. He wanted me to talk more Michigan hockey when I was a radio host in Ann Arbor. And I said, ah, you know, Red, nobody really calls about hockey or nobody. He's like, you. so then he he would, he would said, well, you have to hang around with hockey people and start giving them something to talk about. He didn't take no, he didn't take no for an answer there. 
And then he said, why don't you broadcast from Yost Ice Arena on Fridays when you do your show? So I, I was like, okay, I'll do it. So, uh, you know, and I talked a lot more hockey. I'm over there. I'm up in the booth. And, you know, hockey people would come in. I would put them on the air. But then they had this, uh, not the Zamboni, but they would bring out this edger. They would chop up the ice, and it would be so loud. It would be like doing a broadcast with a lawnmower in the background. And so I, I told Red, I was like, I can't broadcast there anymore because of this edger. And he said, I'll take care of that. No more, <laughs> no more edger. Yeah, it was quiet. Nobody was making any noise. And I thought, you know, it's nice to have Red, you know, calling the shots because uh, it was as quiet. People would make all kinds of noise. No more noise. Quiet for the broadcast while we were up there. So thanks to Red Berenson for that. All right, Scar, can you name the, the players that are left on the Michigan basketball team? Yeah, it's, it's uh, there, there's a there's there's a good side also to that, Danny. It's a downside. You don't want to lose Doug, and you know you don't want to lose these guys that you you've invested in. But you know, Danny, college basketball has changed, and you know if if you get the right coach, and he and he has the wisdom to identify the right transfers, we got to get this guy hired pretty quick. But if you get the right coach with with the right wisdom to identify the right transfers and the ability to bring them in. We just watched Colorado State last night beat the heck out of Virginia. Colorado State had all graduates, old dudes, 22, 23-year-old guys. That was their lineup. And you win with old guys in in college basketball. You don't win with these these young guys. And, you you know, I, I almost think if I was coaching basketball now, I might want to just forget about even spending a ton of e- emphasis on recruiting high school kids because, you know, you, you win with older guys. You, you mess around with these young kids, then they end up leaving. But anyway, there's it's not a terrible thing, Denny. I'm going to throw a name, and I know you're going to beat me up. That's not on the list. Okay, I don't care. But I'm just giving you – his. this is the kind of guy we got to find, maybe with not his baggage. This Will Wade at McNeese State – the former LSU coach that, you know, is on tape doing all the things he did. But watch – I'm going to watch his team. I think they play Thursday. Watch this McNeese State team. He's got all transfers. They were all at two or three different – a couple different places. But you know what? The guy had the wisdom to identify the right guys. Now, it's in a different league, but they beat some good people. Okay, he, that's what we got to find. That that skill, I think, in college basketball now. Uh, you know, my I, my buddy, I said, I said it's more important than the ability to teach pick and roll. He said, I don't know. There's a lot of guys that can't coach. I don't know. You got to have a. You got to be able to do all that though. You got to teach pick and roll and identify this great talent. And how can I put that whole puzzle together? You know, even though he's a great player, will he blend in with the guys I'm bringing in? Does he fit my system? Anyway, this Will Wade at McNeese State, someone will hire him, Danny, at a big school, okay? Because what he did is now legal at LSU, okay? So, and, and, and Michigan's going to stand up and say, oh, he, you know, we can't hire a guy like that. But I guarantee you. Michigan so, will. That, that's been Michigan's hill for, for 20 years. Yeah. We'll let, you know, Maryland, Maryland will go hire that guy if this guy I'm fails. Gonna, Michigan you know, will not hire him. You're right about that. USC will hire hire that guy, sure. and we're going to have to face him. And that guy can recruit, and he can build a pro. But if it's not him, you think Michigan kind of- should? You think Michigan should hire Will? If they said, "Hey, Scar, uh, if Ward Manuel gave you a call and said, man, 'Man, I'm torn. Uh, will Wade's this great coach. Are you okay as an alum? Looking yeah, yeah. As, a, as an alum, I'm okay. I want to find out more. If there's more to the story." But I'd like to find out more about it. But I'm, uh, you know, I don't have a problem giving guys check and Well, chance. I'll come back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be worried in this situation when you're saying there's more. What we know about him is that uh, he was making big ass offers to high school players for six yeah. figures. He was on the phone, and the FBI ta- uh, tapped his, uh, what is it, phone tap? Yeah, fo- tapped his phone, and you know he's on there talking about you know giving money. That's that's the problem. That when get it. Hey, Chris he Beard, supposed to do that, that's what he did. I know Chris Beard had that issue with his wife. He was at Texas. He was, he won everywhere he is. Now he's old miss hired him. Texas tech. Yeah. yeah Texas he won at Texas tech. Right. He was at Texas building Texas. Yeah. And they you know, fired and that's him. The guy that, you know, worked under Bobby Knight, you know, but guess what? Old miss hired him. 
you know, well, they right. do you think that uh, that Michigan with the that domestic violence situation that never went to court because his wife uh, wouldn't testify, you would. Uh, and so he's clean that way. You would hire uh, Chris Beard at Michigan. He is a great coach. Yeah, Danny, I would hire those guys. I would. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't hire Beard or Wade. So I, I get it. Those guys are great coaches. So there you go. So you're not a you're not a forgiving. I thought you were more of a forgiving kind of guy. Well, I would say that I am a forgiving guy, and I am for second uh, chances. But when it comes down to, you know, uh, the Michigan fit, you got to be a Michigan fit, and in Michigan, their their whole identity as a as a university for the past twenty years, or if you want to go uh, since nineteen sixty nine is not giving money to high school players. Now you can say, well, what about the Fab Five? Well, you can say whatever you want. That's their number one identity. And so they're not going to go with the the poster child of giving money okay. to, uh, you know, they're the great coach. And look, you know, I, I, I like that a coach went through the legal system and everything else. I look at coaching as a privilege. Same thing as playing. And when it comes down to Beard, he is a great coach, but how many times uh, you also have to be a little bit reasonable when you're looking at things. It, that lady, his uh, fiance at the time, called the police and said he was choking her to death, you know, and that's why she called the police because she feared for her safety. Well, yeah, after a couple days, she's like, now I don't want to testify. We have seen, you know, I'm not bringing Chris Beard. All right, so you, you're, if you were the head coach at, if you were the head football coach, Scruggs would have been fired the next day, or he'd be fired now. Well, I would say that if it came to me when it came down to hiring the coaches and when uh, True Wright or whatever Turnkey came to me and said he's got these two situations that he's been arrested with alcohol in the past, and you know the lawyer for Michigan would say, well, technically those are, are, are expunged because it's after a 10-year window. That's how they look at it. I would say, I would want to find out where he's at. If he was like somebody that didn't drink at all, and I would say, well, can we put in a zero tolerance policy about your drinking? If he said, I have a glass of wine here or then, I, I still would say, uh, I know this is in the past, but we're going to put a zero tolerance policy. I would put a zero tolerance policy if I would have hired him. If he would have said, no, that's not going to do it. And then I, I, I would have put that into it. So no, he would not be. Oh, let's assume it wasn't. What would you do now? Unless there's a situation where Scruggs came up and said uh, he got his DUI, he had called for an Uber and was just sitting in his car because it was cold that night and they had it running, and that's how they got him, I could say, all right, it's pretty easy to, you know, he, he, he did the right thing. He called Uber. It's not technically right to be sitting in your car operating it while you're, you know, above a .08. I could see in a situation like that where you could bring him back, but it'd have to be a situation like that. People have uh, putting all types of hypotheticals. That's really the only one that I could see where I would, where I would keep him on the team. Okay. All right. Those are, those are decisions leaders have to make. I had to make Correct. many of them as a, as a head football coach and as an athletic director and not fun. No, no, those aren't fun. Those are tough. You're going to get criticized either way it goes on that. Uh, those are those are the ones, and, and that falls into the category scar. That's why you got paid the big bucks. Yeah, well, not in high school. You want to be a head coach? I mean, you make decisions part. about kids. I mean, I'm, I had to make decisions about kids, and I just knew that if, if you throw this kid off the team or this, that, or whatever, he's going to end up being going to be on the streets, and uh, he's going to deal with the law. And in many cases, that happened. And I, I had you had to think about all those decisions, you know, when you, when you make, when you make a decision about a kid who, who screwed up. So it's tough. What about this one? Scar Moose says we need to hire John Beeline until we can find the right fit. Well, the problem with Beeline is, is, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, unless you go straight up all wrong, well, think about Beeline. I thought, and I, I didn't think about this, but think about Beeline. Like if he got the job right now, B, John Beeline could go out and get 10 transfers, three and four year guys, and put a team together and he could do well. And, and like I, initially, I thought, well, Beeline wouldn't be good because he, who's going to want to play for a guy who's only going to be there one or two years? 
Because then he talk about only doing it one year or something. He didn't talk about it. There's been oh. some speculation oh. because he's seven. You know what? When you think about it now, old. I mean, I, I people are like, well, the president. I don't know how old the president's uh, the presidential candidates. Yeah. They're like seventy five. Like you know, they're still the doing thing, their job. The thing about today's college basketball, if John Beeline got the job, he he could go out and get ten transfers. He could compete right away because he, you know, he knows he has an eye for talent. He'd be all over that Ivy League. He'd, he'd find uh, big guys that can step out of the three and bring the big guy out, make Zach Eady play defense at the three-point line. You know, kind of, he knows exactly what he wants. You know, he would he would get 10 guys that could fit his – and he's going to have about 10 scholarships available now. I would be excited if, if Michigan came up and said that they're hiring John Beeline and they are bringing him back. I would be excited. Yeah, I would too. Okay. He, I didn't, initially, I'm like, no way, because you won't be able to recruit – but now when I think about it, it's like there's 10 uh, uh, slots ready and you can just go straight transfers and whatever's left, Will Cheddar, whatever's left on that on that roster. But there's about there's got to be about eight, eight, nine scholarships available. Yeah, I don't know at what age it becomes uh, an issue where but I, I do recall. Joe Paterno. And I really liked Joe Paterno when he coached Penn State. I used to go to the Big Ten coaches meetings. I would sit around uh, and after the coaches meetings. I would go to the uh, hospitality suite. I would sit around and listen to Joe Paterno for really hours over the years and talk football. But when in the later years, when Joe Paterno would be answering questions, they would say, hey, Joe, and he'd be looking up there, the like, lights are too bright. And then he would say, I don't know what you guys. And everybody thought, well, he's just being a, you know, cute. That's just cute. He's an old man being cute. Like, I can't hear what you're saying. And then, you know, it was there. But we gave him a break. I gave him a break because it's like, OK, you know, he's in his 70s. Let's not, you know, stick his feet to the fire on every single thing. And then, you know, it, what happened happened with him. And a lot of that, he used the same thing. Like, I didn't know what Jerry was doing. Like, oh, you didn't know what Jerry was doing. Okay, well, you didn't know what Jerry was doing. I think so, Beeline is pretty sane and sharp. Yeah, he I, seems I, like it. That's yeah. right. I, and so I'm not comparing. You know, I'm just comparing that you get right. you get into your 70s. And uh, but I look, if they want to hire John Beeline, uh, I would be for that. Now well, I would not he be. Could win, no. He could win right away. He what could, if he could, Star, he could, he could. what if Beeline says? I'm here. I'll commit to two or three years, but I want to have a. I want to be able to name my successor. What do you say if you're Ward Manuel? Well, you know that's another thing I had to talk about. You know, Saudi Saudi Washington, Denny is a good coach, yeah. and I, I I thought Beeline recommended him. Didn't Beeline recommend Saudi to replace him? It was him I, don't, I don't I don't remember anyway, that. Saudi Washington, he hasn't had, you know, he hasn't led. So he'd be another guy you you hire from, you know, within. But yeah, John there Beeline, isn't a, yeah. John Beeline. I would, no to, I would just I would jump in, Scott. The next coach has to have prior coaching experience. Juwan didn't. That would be one of the, if I'm putting out a boilerplate of things that I have to have if I'm Ward Manual, number one on that list is going to be prior coaching, head coaching experience. Yeah. I'm not taking another guy learning on the job. Uh, that's just the way it is right now. So I, w yeah. that means that Saudi's not going to get the job. No, I get it. And, and you know, these, yeah, but he, he understood the system. He, you know, he, he would, uh, he would plug right in probably. I don't, you know, again, you don't know what system he would use, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know who would, uh, if, uh, if Ward would go for that kind of deal where he could hire, he, he doesn't really have a, uh, a tree out there coaching. I don't think there's former beeline guys that are head coaches anywhere that I don't know that there are, but anyway, I like John beeline. And if so, if someone told me, you know, beeline was going to have the job for, for even one year until they, they I, I'd be excited about it because I really firmly believe he could find a way to win next year. Just like the guy, Denny, the guy at mixed D state won one year. And you look at Illinois. I've always said I think the best coach in the Big Ten is the guy at Illinois. I watched yeah, him. At, I, I think he's the best coach in the Big Ten. I watched him at Stephen Austin. Guy, you know, just smart, tough. They play smart. Then I, he goes to Oklahoma State. And I was not happy when Illinois hired him. I knew we were going to have problems. Michigan has never beaten the guy. We've never beaten Brad Underwood. Juwan never beat him. That's true. Uh, the guy, the guy can flat out coach, and you know what else he did? He, he's showing though he can do. He identified transfer talent. What did he bring in this year? 
You know, he brought in he brought in some guys, man, from some small schools. You know, I'm, that's I'm gonna, you go ahead. Sorry, I was yeah, gonna, that's I'm, what you got to be able to do, man. And and uh, you know, Beeline will will have that kind of uh, ability to do that. Well, the part about bringing in the transfers is, uh, you know, part of the uh, the issue with Michigan. You know, you say, you know, let's bring in a complete transfer team. You wouldn't deal with the high school players. I think Michigan's got to approach it the exact opposite way. They have to go to the high school ranks and they have to bring in players and develop them. They can't get – there's the coach at Drake that a lot of people like, DeVries, and I like him myself, but – Part of uh, DeVries, he's got a bunch of players that he would take with him. It's almost like a ready-made team, including the player of the year in the mountain or the Missouri Valley, which is his son. But his son, even though Drake's academics seem to be pretty good, it, he's likely not going to be able to get in. Well, maybe, maybe we got to do what Colorado State did and, and just take a lot of older transfers, graduate transfers. That's just the grad, grad transfers. Yeah, we got it's what we got to do. You, listen, if you want to coach at Michigan, you can't complain about the academics. Don't take the job, okay? If no, you're going to take the job at Michigan, like Rich Rod, and whine about the academics, <laughs> no, really, okay. don't, don't take the job. If you think you can bring guys in with, uh, you know, with a pulse, because Michigan ain't uh, this ain't West Virginia, man. This ain't uh, uh, whatever the hell he was, Glenville State or whatever it was. Okay, so you can't complain about the academics if you take the Michigan job, but you just have to do it with graduate transfers. You got to look at different type of guys, and it can that can be an advantage for you in a way to play at Michigan and be a graduate. Tra- so you just you got to find the system that works for you. Jim Harbaugh did it. He brought 12 in last year. So it it, it can be done. You just got to be, uh, you know, have the wisdom to bring, identify the right players. Yeah. I think the, the weird part here is this next coach, it's a, a rebuild. I'm not expecting much next year, even though you do have the transfer portal, but it just goes back to where, Jawan Howard somewhere sitting here. He's going to be watching the tournament. He's going to see Antonio Reeves lighting it up for Kentucky. Like this guy's a great shooter. And he's, he's watching Shannon go for 40 points in Minneapolis and, and you know, tear it up as Illinois. And, you know, Michigan had Shannon, uh, Caleb Lowe. No, he didn't. Why, why, of the year. Why, why bring him in on a visit if you can't get him in? I don't know because well, he, then you're going to whine about it. You're going to tell everybody well, I couldn't get him in. Don't the, bring him in on a visit if you can't get him in. The kid was like, that would be my uh, argument. Why'd you even well, bring him to Ann Arbor? Because, you know, the kid, because he's got talent. The kid said that he would no, take No, you don't even bring him in, man. If he, well, if what he if he says, I want to take the summer school classes yeah. and, uh, and that'll make me eligible and I'm oh, in? Well, you got to you get, get that stuff hashed out ahead of time. Well, you know, that, he, that was hashed out, but you can't. He, well, you can't, if he was willing to do all you that, you would have gone at him and tell him that, hey, wait, you told us that you were going to. You were going to okay, take well, classes, and now he's like, you know, Illinois is offering me a hundred thousand. Well, whatever, you got out recruited there, then, man. Don't you know, don't blame don't blame Michigan. I agree with you on Caleb Love when he came in, and they looked at the transcripts, and they're like, "There's zero chance that you're getting in here." Okay. Well, that's know, Michigan. One percent chance they should have moved on. I get it. It's it, it's we're different. Michigan, right. Notre Dame, Stanford, we're different. We ain't Michigan State. It is what it is. You you can complain complain about it, but we've been able to. Beeline found a way to win. Jim found a way to win. So, you know, we got to do it. We got to do what we got to do, man. All right, Scar. I don't know. The uh-huh. the uh, way that the, the feedback is going, people are talking about, I don't know, cheap drinks. That you, now, you're not a, a, a drinker, but, I, you know, I, I see somebody mentioning Thunderbird, which I'm familiar with uh, back in the day and uh, M-Dog 2020. I, I would not. <laughs> Mad Dog. I would not That's recommend. I, I remember that records. I wouldn't then recommend Thunderbird or Mad Dog to anyone out there. And like it's, yeah, it's potent. It tastes terrible. But that that's not something that if you're going to drink, you you want to mess with. Danny, what was that place on the corner of Packard and State Campus Corner? Yeah, it was the the keg, wasn't it? Called? Oh man, they they had the little spy up on top there watching people, so they weren't stealing. But we'd go get a case of beer there. Man, I can't remember the name. It was the most rot gut. We didn't have no money. And we'd get a case of that stuff and bring it back to the dorm. And, uh, you know, you got to. if you're on a football team now, if you could just walk into a place and say, oh, back in the day, you could have keg parties. Denny, back in the day, in my day, you could have a keg sitting right outside in the hallway at South Quad Dorm. Nobody cared. 
This is Gar, world now. These guys can't do none of that stuff. Back in the day as a student, you could take a keg into Michigan Stadium. That's right. Yeah. I can't imagine, you know, sitting over there. All right, pour me another one. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, we had, uh, he, there. Uh, there was a keg party in South Quad every night of the week. On a Tuesday, somebody in South Quad, there was a keg somewhere. I would, I, I Sunday don't know. night. Scar, I think that stuff's still going on, by the way. I <laughs> I wonder I now, though, if you're a football player. Like, so before you could go in, you couldn't even get a, you know, a, somebody couldn't say, hey, here's a, a free sucker for you. You know, that's against NCAA. But if you're a football player now, do you go in and you go to the, you just say, hey, where do I sign for my food? I, I, you know, are these guys just getting free meals and free drinks and, Hey, hey, this is so-and-so. Send over a couple of kegs. You know what, Denny? You know what? We did have a form of NIL back in the day because there's, <laughs> place, there's places we could go, and they would hook us up with a pizza or half price. Pizza Bob's used to take care, help out the players. I still go. When I go to Ann Arbor, I will still go and spend money at Pizza Bob's just because they took care of us as players years ago. You know, and there's some of the – some of the uh, a step drinking establishments they would uh, you know you have a big game you big a big win we win a game they would they would buy you know buy rounds for for the guys so in a way we had a a, a crumb of nil uh, yeah, they, were players. they let us maybe let us in the front of the line let you in free and maybe get you a picture or whatever yeah, I can remember Remy Hamilton working uh, as a bartender after he was done. And, you know, there, there's uh, – I don't know what the point of that story is. Actually, if you look right above my head, there's a picture of 1994 Remy Hamilton kicking that game-winning field goal against uh, Notre Dame. Look, you know, uh, there is the ability where you can get coupons and things like that. I've, I've heard all kinds of stuff like that back in the day. I just wonder now that – you were pulling up in an old beater that needed tires and everything, bald tires and the car you were at. Now they're, they're pulling up in uh 2024 escalates. <laughs> that might be a little bit different. They just go in and, and the owner says, pick whatever you want. I don't know how it works now. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I imagine, I, I, I'm sure that there's people that still want players hanging around their uh, establishments. You know, it, 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 it helps business. You know, if JJ McCarthy's at your little bar, your little restaurant, you know, if quorum's hanging around there, there's it, it it helps. So there's guys that would always want players hanging, you know, at their place. Yeah, well, I've I've heard that some of the sororities, young ladies, they might get waive the cover charge, you know, to come on in and that's right. You know, maybe have a drink. We we'll have to get the old uh, Greek freak on here and have him tell us what it's like down here <laughs> in Ann Arbor. What's going on at the bars in Ann Arbor? All right, Scar, do you have any final thoughts? No, everything's good, Danny. We're fired up. Uh, we're gonna I'm gonna get to practice soon and um, practice. You know, and um, I'm hoping to see good things, man. But uh, we're, we're guys are working, man. A lot of a uh, lot of competition and uh, very important uh, next six weeks for a lot of players. You know, I remember being it, going through it, and you they are they are competing like crazy in every drill to to beat out the guy next to them. And it's it's happening as we speak. Love it. I'll be watching basketball tomorrow. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You'll have a sports update coming your way Friday, and then I'll talk with you on Monday. Great job, Scar. All right, Denny, go blue. There he is, Jim Scarcelli. Smash that like button.